This conference to... will now be recorded. Um, I'm Milo Bircham. I think everybody here knows me, and I'm going to talk about Antarctica. But I'll start off with something that Mary Ann wanted me to uh, introduce. Um, first of all, you know, just through Audubon, you know, it's a you know conservation organization, and there's a, a letter writing campaign going on right now, uh, addressing the BLM wanting to develop uh, lands in the Arctic. Uh, this uh, this the D1 lands. Anyway, I won't go into too many details of it, but the comment period period is open now, and you can go to the Audubon website or Audubon Alaska website and find information on it and see how to uh, how, how you can comment. Um, that said, we also like to open up meetings with bird sightings, and this is a pretty active year, especially if anybody's, well, you don't even have to have feeders out. Uh, any have sightings of interest? Uh, other than the multitude of white wing crossbills and other ditches that are around this year. Nothing of note. Um, white wing crossbills, well, we, we broke the record on the Christ, Christmas bird count for both white wing crossbills and red crossbills. Uh, and both are around in huge numbers, but we've had years with lots of red crossbills before, uh, at least you know, at feeder level, but I've never had white wing crossbill come down uh, you know, to, to my feeders before, but they are back and forth all the time right now, and everybody's seeing the same thing. And where spruce cones have fallen out of the trees, uh, these birds are foraging on the ground on fallen cones along Power Creek Road and, you know, a, anywhere around here. So it's the best opportunity to see white wing crossbills that we've maybe ever had. So, uh, and uh, Anchorage has the same thing, I think. Uh, so it's, it's region wide. Uh, pretty neat. Uh, that's something to capitalize on. Anything else? That's it for birds, just the finches. Okay. Where's the presentation more inclusive by turning on, I don't want to do that, turn on subtitles. Okay, I had a message that was blocking my screen and didn't know how to make it go away. I was going to call my my presentation chasing ice, but damn, <laughs> damn the lock didn't steal it right out from underneath me last week. So I was going to modify it a little bit and say chasing ice and bears and penguins and seals, but I thought, oh no, that's a little bit uh, too close. And so uh, we'll just call it Antarctica, my first impressions. Uh, we'll go with that. But I can't believe he would stoop so low to steal <laughs> my, my title. Um, where to start? So I'll, I'll start with my retirement. Um, in uh, the summer, June of, of 2022, I retired from my job uh, with the Forest Service that I'd been at since, well, just over 20 years, and uh, kind of opened up a new chapter. And all I can say is it's been a blast so far. And I'm not rich in retirement, so I'm looking for you know little gigs here and there you know to help me along the way. And some really nice ones have fallen in place. And that's uh, what I want to kind of introduce this with. Almost right off the bat, uh, a filmmaker from Anchorage contacted me and asked if I wanted to run a boat with it for him on a filming project in Alaska's Arctic, you know, to film polar bears. And so by the 1st of August, I was launching a boat at uh, Prudhoe Bay and ran 100 miles west uh, to a remote section of shoreline between Prudhoe Bay and, and Utqiagvik and spent a month there living on this bow picker and weathering storms behind little sandbars, lucky to find two or three feet of water deep enough to anchor in uh, in protected areas. The whole area was so shallow, uh, but it was a wild and woolly month. And the theme chasing ice isn't far from the truth of what my life has been like since I retired. We are due, Paula and I, a tropical vacation. We did go to Guatemala for about four days, and we've been to California visiting family. But also, just living here, these last two summers have not been very nice. We've had a lot of wet, cool weather. And, um, and then my jobs have been uh, to the Arctic. Here's an iceberg in the Beaufort Sea, 10 miles offshore uh, from Alaska's north coast. We, we even jumped in and went swimming here. We needed a bath so bad. Uh, the water temperature was 31, uh, according to the, the sonar. Uh, 
And we had polar bears come right up to our bow picker in three feet of water and check us out. Uh, so it, it was an awesome assignment and, you know, spending a month there. And at one time, on several occasions, you could see caribou, muskox, and polar bear at the same time. Uh, yeah, just wonderful. King eiders would come up and feed around the boat. And, um, anyway, it was a dream. So, so what are the short birds in the back? Oh, yeah, this is a polar bear walking through a flock of uh, red-necked and red fallow ropes. Uh, so we were filming the fallow ropes. And here, you saw what the sandbar looked like a second ago. Like, how could anything hide out there? And, uh, and I was supposed to be watching. And uh, there was something wrong with the camera. And he was futzing, and we were futzing, and I was looking around. And all of a sudden, I look up, I go, there's a polar bear. And we've been filming these a really dense flock. This is only a part of it. We've been filming these fallow ropes earlier in the day. And we look up, and here's a polar bear about to walk through those fallow ropes we've been filming. And the camera, he got fixed just in time so he could get some video. And I got a few stills as I walked uh, up to the tip of the sandbar and into the water and swam miles across the bay to another point of land. Uh, they're very aquatic. So that lasted through June or uh, into September of uh, 2022. And then the following winter, so um, February and March, one year ago, I fell into only with about a month's notice uh, a job guiding a trip, a cruise to Antarctica. Uh, so just a few months later, and when I finished the job in the Arctic, I was at a hotel, uh, rep, you know, the, the lobby uh, a restaurant in Dead Horse, um, and I bumped into Hugh Rose. Does anybody here know Hugh Rose? Um, he guides for uh, Dean Rand. He's been a photographer in the state for 30 years, and he's been guiding Antarctic trips for 25 years or so. Well, I bumped into him, and I said, hey, Hugh, uh, I'm retired now, and I've been wanting to actually ask you if you could use anybody, you know, any guides for your Antarctic trips. He goes, Milo, you'd be great for this. And so that led to me being hired uh, the following February. One year ago uh, now is, is when this trip started. Uh, so anyway, flew down to Ushuaia, jumped on the Plancius, and guided my first Antarctic trip. It's with 15 guides, and on this trip we had uh, like 64 passengers. So that was my first Antarctic trip. That's chasing ice all the way to the other end of, uh, of the globe. And then Florian had another job for me this past summer. And you can't really call it ice. Uh, it was on the Katmai coast running a, a boat, that same boat for two and a half months filming brown bears. But given the weather this past summer, you might as well call it chasing ice because it was stormy. It was, it was a horrible summer here as well. So uh, it was you know anything but, but a tropical vacation. But we spent the month filling polar bears on the Katmai coast and just witnessed, you know, incredible, uh, you know, scenery and bears. Brown bears, and, not and polar bears. All, all brown bears. Yeah. It was all brown bears. And so that ended in mid September and in mid October, uh, I had another job working for the same company, Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris, guiding another trip to Antarctica. So there I was to the other end of the earth. So anyway, uh, it's been jumping forth between poles and uh, spending time on the Katmai coast has occupied a lot of my time, uh, especially this past year. The two trips I've made to Antarctica were a little bit different, and I'll do these uh, chronologically. I'll first uh, kind of go through our first trip. The first one with Cheeseman's started mid-February and went to about mid-March. It was just over two weeks. And that so that's our spring, but it equates to their late summer. Uh, so it would have been equivalent to uh, mid-August to mid-September. Uh, so it's their fall, at the end of their season. So, so keep that in mind. So we uh, launched from Ushuaia, the very southern tip of uh, South America, crossed the 600 miles of the Drake Passage. And then this little uh, set of islands here is the South Shetlands. Uh, that's where you first see land, and then make it to the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and many landings and stops to view wildlife. Uh, you can kind of see that blur of points. And so here. what were the seas like in the crossing? Uh, I'll show you some of oh, that. Good. Okay, uh, yeah. It's notoriously rough. Yeah, right. it, it, it was probably average rough. Okay. Uh, I don't know that it was extreme, but it, I haven't seen what they call Drake Lake yet. Okay. And I've made you know four crossings of it, or, or, or even a little bit more of that with the trip to South Georgia. So these are the... Uh, 
the jumble of landings that we made throughout the Antarctic Peninsula and in the South Shetland Islands. Um, so we just spent almost uh, 10 days uh, morning, you know, you know, doing two landings or cruises a day, in the, one in the morning, one in the evening, uh, just sampling you know, a variety of places. And uh, this puts uh, name tags on some of those. And some of you, especially with the Science Center, probably know some biologists. I think um, Ann Schaefer has worked in uh, uh, Palmer Station. Palmer, yep. And Palmer Station would be right here. Uh, so we made it very close to Palmer Station. In fact, there's a Ukrainian uh, research station very close to there that we stopped at and made it to Peterman Island as far south as we went. Um, it's another 80 miles to the Antarctic Circle. Uh, we didn't, you know, we, I've not been to the Antarctic Circle. So these are the places that we visited uh, on last, my spring trip or, you know, uh, Austral Fall. And the sites that we visited on the peninsula in the most recent trip that I did were a subset of these. We spent less time on the Antarctic Peninsula after visiting South Georgia, um, but visited some of the same places and, and a few new ones. How long does the crossing take? Uh, the 600 miles takes about two days. And then let me see. You asked how rough it was. This one's about 30 seconds. This is an 89 meter boat, uh, the fanciest. And this uh, is going into uh, a headwind. You know, probably 10 to 15 foot seas, maybe. And not necessarily extreme, but if you get seasick, you can be seasick. And there's, there's plenty of people that, that are, but also medications these days um, go a long way. They close the decks when it's like this. Yeah. You can't just hang out on deck. Uh, and I, we weren't watching real closely, but there's birds flying around out there. And the large crossings that we do are a birder's dream. And so it's always a bummer when you can't go on deck because you can't watch uh, for the seabirds. But that's what I'll go through first is some of the wildlife that we see on the crossings. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of great birds that you'll never see anywhere else on Earth except for during these big crossings. Um, this is not one of the rare ones. In fact, it's one of the most common. But this is a, a southern giant petrel uh, with this big, massive bill. And if, you've seen, if you know other petrels, they're usually smaller, kind of dainty birds. Uh, these are near, nearing the size of, of some albatrosses. And the very similar northern giant petrel, which differs from the southern giant petrel, basically by the tip of the bill, uh, at least is the easiest way to distinguish them. Uh, this is pale or yellowish uh, bill tip, whereas the northern giant petrel has a reddish uh, tinge to the tip of the bill is one of the best field marks for telling them apart. But many of these seabirds, uh, the pe giant petrels and the albatrosses, and some of the pet other petrels will follow the boat for hours, sometimes cruising right alongside. Uh, you know, a lot of times we sit right on the back of the boat, you know, on the deck on the back, uh, waiting to photograph these birds. And then the, the albatross will drift, you know, half a mile away, and then it'll come right back and they'll follow the boat. Individual birds will follow for hours. Uh, so it is spectacular. And this is one of the, you know, real prizes, you know, of any, you know, uh, uh, pelagic birding expedition is getting to see wandering albatross. This is an immature bird right here. These birds have the longest wingspan of any bird. It can be up to t almost 12 feet long, and they just sa sail the oceans effortlessly. Uh, the wind is their friend, and they cover you know hundreds of miles effortlessly. We saw lots of uh, wandering albatross. Uh, uh, that was a thrill. And on this most recent trip. We saw smaller numbers of the big albatross. Uh, we saw other albatross species, but we saw some southern and northern royal albatross as well, which look very similar to these. These are quite common. In fact, they're even on the South American mainland, you know, the channels near Ushuaia and Pucarenas, you can see black browed albatross, but they're one of the boat, uh, birds that follow the boat closely at times. This one was very close. And then a whole bunch of smaller birds that birders go nuts over. Prions, uh, this is an Antarctic prion, which looks very similar to a slender-built prion. I'm still learning these birds. We have some very good, some of the other guides are very good birders, and some of the passengers are very good birders. And so I'm in the process of learning these. And in filing my images now, I'm further learning these birds and, and how to distinguish them. But anyway, great birding. This is a poor picture, but it's kind of a documentary documentary photo of a soft 
a soft plumaged petrel. I never even heard of the name of some of these birds. Soft plumaged petrel is another one we saw on the first trip. We didn't see so many on the most recent one. And after 600 miles in two days, the windows are all covered with salt. This is looking at the side of land um, entering the Antarctic Peninsula. This is the South Shetland Island, Islands, the, the first views. And so what were my first impressions of this place? And I'll, I'll show you some other pictures. I didn't expect it to be, you know, so big, the, the mountains just precipitous, you know, they would be noteworthy no matter where they occurred, uh, but, but the mountains are precipitous. And this sounds kind of dumb, but, oh, uh, I'll, I'll go into my, our first landing first. Um, so we've been, you know, crossing for, two, you know, two days. Everybody's, some people have been seasick, you know, people are anxious to see their first penguins and stuff. And this is my first time to Antarctica. So uh, we got there late in the day on the, on the second day, and we wanted to get people ashore. So Yankee Harbor is, is an accessible place on, in the South Shetlands. We made our first landing. This is uh, getting one of the Zodiacs ashore. This is the ship's doctor, Lynn uh, Houle, uh, right here already on the shore. But literally, I had tears in my eyes when I saw my first penguins up close. We had seen a few at sea. Uh, but seeing these things and literally walking between us, you know, uh, walking you know, for standing this close together, having penguins walk between you, you know, just took my breath away seeing it for the first time. It, it was amazing. These are Gen 2 penguins, and there's the ship at anchor right outside of the Yankee Harbor in, in the South Shetlands. Uh, this was late at night. We only got ashore for about an hour, and we had 64 passengers on this trip. So you can imagine the Zodiac shuttling back and forth. We have uh, up to 10 Zodiacs available. Uh, to get people ashore, but yeah, there's a lot of work that, that you know, that, that we have to do, the, the guides. And then for uh, over a week, twice a day, you have landings and cruises and get experiences like this. So this is one of the passengers photographing um, Gen 2 penguins at Mickelson Harbor. Um, and uh, this is all the passengers and the, the guides uh, on that first trip in the, in the lounge on the ship. Uh, posing for a group photo here. There were 64 passengers. And interesting is that uh, Mark Carwardine, uh, if anybody knows the name, uh, is a relatively famous author from Great Britain uh, who has written like 60 books. Uh, he was one of the guides. And he has a marine mammal following. Uh, uh, there's a marine, he's authored like the premier field guide to marine mammals of the world. And uh, he has a following of marine mammal enthusiasts. And 30 some of the passengers on the ship were with him, uh, you know, came with him, you know, because of, you know, him guiding other trips and stuff. So Mark Carwardine uh, was one of the guys that I got to know very well, super nice guy, very funny. And he's done everything, everything he's done, you know, with BBC and, you know, you name it. And so the, it was sort of a whale focused trip, but this is the only picture I'm gonna show you of a whale because that's the thing I could photograph the least. I'm running Zodiacs with 10 people yeah. on them, and it's hard to take pictures when you're running a Zodiac trying to get pictures for 10 other people. Most of my own pictures come when we're ashore, and that's kind of a conundrum, and a, you know, it, it, it's frustrating for me at times wanting to get pictures of all this stuff, but my first job is to help everybody else get pictures, and uh, after that, if the opportunity presents, I'll get my own. But did we ever see whales? So their fall, you know, at the end of the season in, in Antarctica, the whales have been fattening up all summer, feeding on krill, and they are everywhere. Uh, we saw humpbacks, fin whales, minkies, a few killer whales. Um, uh, did I say fin whales? Um, anyway, just a multitude of whales at any time. You know, they, they were often in sight and sometimes many at the same time. Uh, that, that was great whale viewing. So my job, along with the 15 other guides, is... Uh, well, the, the ship's crew, th there's a crew that belong to the ship, to the Plancius, uh, and that includes the hotel staff, the cooks, and the people that uh, maintain the rooms and clean the ship and run the ship and launch the Zodiacs. The fleet of Zodiacs belong to the ship, but we run the Zodiacs for the guiding, for the actual excursions and stuff. And so when they're being dropped by the ship's crew above, uh, mid-deck is where one of us jumps on, or you know, whichever boat we're going to run at the time, and it gets lowered to the water, or this one's being raised. And here's all the guides kind of powwowing about what we're about to do, whatever, kind of making the plans for whatever uh, landing we're gonna make. And 
Here's a picture of me running a Zodiac. Uh, this is called Spurt Island. Uh, this was a Zodiac tour on a landing and many of the clients uh, <coughs> in the boat right there. So that's our main responsibility, along, along with a lot of other things, you know, speaking, you know, giving presentations, holding hands, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, helping people, you know, get through. Um, so anyway, the, the tasks are many, but I have to say it was, it was enjoyable. So first impressions, you know, this landscape is off the charts and these peaks and spires and glaciers would stand out no matter where they were, you know, regardless of them being one of the most, most remote parts of the world. This is Lamar Channel, uh, one of the very famous places. These peaks, I think, approach 2,000 feet coming uh, right out of the ocean. And uh, here's a, another picture of the same with our ship uh, in it for scale. So this landscape, you know, holds its own uh, anywhere. It, it was truly spectacular. And like I said, I, I know this is going to sound dumb, but I'm surprised at the, the glaciation. Like I knew there'd be glaciers, but like it was all glaciers. Like the only places that there was exposed rock was was cliffs and low elevations. Again, this is the end of the summer. Uh, and wherever there was little islands or little rock shelves that were there, that's where penguin colonies were. But that was the uh, a, a minor part of the landscape. It was mostly vertical rock and glaciated uh, landscape. So that surprised me that it was that glaciated. They, they dominated the whole landscape. It was, it was impressive. And massive icebergs. These were actually closer to South Georgia on my more recent trip. Um, but yeah, my mass ice stamp dominates the landscape. So I'll introduce you to some of the main characters, penguins, uh, Gentoo, uh, pictured here, and I'll, I'll contrast them with portraits of these same birds taken on my most recent trip. This is the end of the season, and there's you know more bare ground uh, than, than on my more recent trip, which was very, very early in the season. Um, and the photo opportunities were quite a bit different. This is the most common penguin on the Antarctic Peninsula. They're a winner with climate change. Their range is expanding. Then they're doing quite well, but still they're struggling with some of the effects. Um, climate change is resulting in increased snowfalls on the Antarctic Peninsula. These guys nest on bare ground, and they need that bare ground to be exposed before they can nest. And so, but they seem to be adaptable. Um, but what we were seeing, well, I'll go into the, the nesting cycle. Uh, Chinstrap penguins, um, we saw relatively small numbers of those until uh, a landing towards the end of this trip in the South Shetlands. And they're kind of uh, not doing as well with climate change. And Adeli penguins, which are a loser with, uh, with climate change for sure, and their uh, range is receding south and Gentoos are expanding. Um, but Adelis are really hurting with climate change and it probably has to do with their access to krill under the ice. Uh, mm -hmm and the sea ice lasting less and less uh, you know, long each summer. And again, contrast this with pictures that I'm going to show you of the same area. This is Coverville Island, uh, a, a big Gentoo colony that we visited both times on both trips. And you can see all the bare ground. And here in the upper left, you can see juveniles that are about ready to fledge. This is a juvenile. Uh, well, it's still got a molt, uh, but these are uh, hack, were hatched this season, but are getting quite big. And I don't know if there's any small nestlings. Here's a smaller nestling underneath this bird right here. But there was a variety of sizes, and that late snowfall had pushed nesting quite, quite late. And birds like this might not have a very good chance. You know, winter's a few weeks away uh, in, in this case. Uh, so this is probably around the you know, equivalent to the 1st of September in, in our latitude, in our hemisphere. And then this is what we saw. Again, it's neat to contrast the, the two visits that I had in spring and fall. So this is late in the season. The snowpack has been sitting there all summer, and these penguins have been walking back and forth to their nesting you know, little rock outcrops yeah. up high on a snowy ridge and doing it and pooping, and then the poop you know, darkens the snow, and so it melts a little bit more, plus packing it down. So there are these penguin highways that are as high as the head of a penguin. Oh, and gentoos are the third largest penguin. There's emperors, there's kings, and gentoos are the next bigger, but they are, you know, noticeably smaller than emperors and, and kings. Uh, but I thought this was fascinating. These uh, well-developed highways. This is at Nico Harbor. Sure, that wasn't a jeep trail. Yeah, it looks like a jeep track. 
And then here's a Gen 2 with a chick. And again, you have to worry about these uh, late in the season, relatively small chicks, uh, probably because of the late uh, winter, you know, the, the duration of the snowpack uh, with climate change. Um, but it was wonderful seeing all the chicks. Uh, so just from a visual point of view, it, it, was, it was amazing. Here's uh, another Gen 2 uh, feeding, it just fed uh, an even smaller chick. You can see it regurgitated the food and a little drool running between them. And we made it far enough south on this trip to see good numbers of uh, Adelie penguins. And Peterman Island, the areas that are closer to Palmer Station, uh, still have uh, good numbers of Adelie penguins. And Peterman Island is one. And here's a, a molting adult right here. Here's two adults, one uh, still molting and the other one uh, pretty clean. Looks like they're having a, a debate or telling a joke. <clears throat> Here's some Gen 2s feeding some relatively, or a Gen 2 adult feeding uh, two chicks that are relatively large during a snowfall. And here's a portrait of an Adeli. There's a portrait of a Gen 2 and a close up of a chin strap. So those are the three penguins that we saw on our first trip in the fall, but we saw more than penguins. I told you we saw a lot of whales, even though I don't have very many pictures of those. The marine mammal viewing on the Antarctic Peninsula was very good uh, in their fall. Not so good in the trip I just took, which was early in the spring, and I wasn't really expecting that. Antarctic fur seals were very common. They're expanding their range uh, with climate change, and they're becoming more abundant on the Antarctic Peninsula. Kind of neat how long the whiskers are, kind of like the fur seals, the uh, northern fur seals, like out in the Pribilofs. There's an Antarctic fur seal with a glacier behind it. And two Antarctic fur seals, kind of young ones, but the blonde uh, color phase is relatively rare. Uh, and we did get to see this one on the peninsula. They're more common on South Georgia, the blonde ones, but on, uh, in the, on the Antarctic Peninsula, they're, they're relatively rare. We we're kind of lucky to see this. Weddell seals are pretty common. Um, they've got a real friendly face is a good way to describe it. Um, they were, we saw lots of those. Here's another one. Uh, it actually had a pup just out, off, off, out of the picture. Uh, this is on Half Moon Island in the South Shetlands. And then the one that everybody wants to see is leopard seals. Uh, we ended up seeing oh, probably a dozen or more on that trip to the peninsula in in, in their fall, I'll call it the, the fall trip. Um, anyway, they were quite abundant. We had many opportunities. This one's swimming around the, an iceberg. This one's uh, lounging on an iceberg. Here's one stretching. And I got a close up where I cropped right here. These guys are famous for being predators, but they also feed on krill. And I'll talk about krill just briefly in a second. But look at their teeth. And all these other seals have a similar type tooth which makes an excellent strain when they partially close their mouth. They can expel, you know, take a mouth food of seawater and krill, and then it can expel the water and strain the, the krill out of it. Uh, anyway, this picture with his mouth wide open like that shows those specialized teeth uh, for straining. And this is one of my favorite pictures from last year. Uh, leopard seal is in a really scenic place uh, resting on an iceberg. This is my only picture of a crab eater. And on this past trip, I, I had the boat close to a, a crab eater that was, we saw many on the first trip, uh, not so many of this past one, but I haven't really had many chances to photograph them myself. And this one, the face is right, because it has almost like a dog-like mus muzzle, but typically they're more just uniform brown colored, not modeled like this. This is colored more like a Weddell. This one kind of threw us uh, for a loop for a little bit, but it's a crab eater seal. And they don't eat crabs, they eat krill. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about krill here. This is what krill looks like. You know, I've heard about it a lot, but actually didn't really know that much about krill. It looks very much like a shrimp. It's, they're closely related to shrimp. Uh, they're larger than I kind of thought. I kind of thought they were kind of a smaller organism. But here's one in my hand that we saw. He just kind of washed up a dead one on the shoreline. And uh, they drive the ecosystem. It's what every almost everything down there is eating. And here's an Adeli penguin with a little panty stain. Uh, you know, it stained it. And the colors on this uh, monitor and the projector are not great. That's bright, vibrant orange uh, stained from krill. Uh, so they're eating. 
and I'll just show you just for difference. It, just see the oh, color yeah. under, under wow. the tail. Um, that's how bright the tail was stained from krill. Yeah, it was fascinating. And I'll introduce a couple other birds. Um, snowy sheepbill, they call them shit chickens. They're, they're kind of despised by many people that visit Antarctica. Joe Kaplan was the best birder uh, on the trip and one of, one of our guides that's been doing this for 20 years. They're his favorite bird and they're you know close to one of mine as well. Uh, after learning so much about them, they do eat shit. Uh, they eat penguin uh, feces. They're very adaptable. They live year round on the Antarctic Peninsula. They're in a family of their own, <coughs> closely related to shorebirds, but they kind of don't have any other really close relatives. Um, and they steal food that's being fed from an adult to a, a, a baby penguin. They'll run right in there. They'll eat carrion. They'll also eat in marine invertebrates, you know, like chitons and stuff like barnacles and stuff. So they're just very, very adaptable and tame as all get out. They'll land on all your gear. They'll walk around your feet. They're curious, and that's kind of why they're so successful, yeah. is exploiting you know, any food opportunity that, that might be down there. And here's one trying to you know, get some uh, uh, feces, you know, uh, penguin feces off the rock right there. How big are they? Um, about a little bit bigger than a pigeon, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah, a little bit bigger, maybe ch almost chicken size. Yeah. And, <laughs> this, you might argue they're not the prettiest thing either, but they're a very unique, very unique bird. Snowy sheathbill. And Antarctic cormorant or Antarctic shag. <coughs> and here's a, a, a South Polar school. Man. Uh, bandit, yeah, yeah. You can actually read the number of the band from the picture. I gave it to the... Uh, uh, Zernadsky Station, the uh, Ukrainian research base, was probably where this band came from, and I shared this with them. So that was my first trip, late in the season, um, nesting penguins, many of them with chicks, some of the chicks you know, almost full grown, uh, lots of bare rock. Uh, oh, I didn't point out, um, I'm going to go back real quick when I introduced the penguins, that one penguin was on pink snow. So a lot of the snow was pink, was was stained with algae, uh, either pink or green. And again, if you saw my slide, uh, you know the original picture uh, is it's on Peterman Island in particular. The snow was just bright pink like that. So it was really interesting. So I'm going to contrast those with my views in in this next trip that I took um, in mid-October to mid-November. So I got back from the Katmai coast in mid-September, and just a month later we had this other Cheeseman's trip, and this one was going to be a little bit different. This was going to go to South Georgia, and the logistics uh, were quite a bit different. So for this trip, rather than going to Ushuaia, Argentina, at the very southern tip of Tierra Fuego, we all flew to Punta Arenas, Chile, and we met at a hotel there. We had a little bit of training, and the guests who arrived early had opportunities for a couple side uh, field trips and stuff. And then we all boarded a jet. There's a once weekly jet to the Falklands and flew 500 miles to Stanley in the Falkland Islands. And this is a little bit of a goat rope. The, the logistics were a little bit tough to deal with, you know, with uh, uh, 94 passengers. This is a bigger trip, you know, almost a fully, uh, fully, uh, a, almost a full boat. We can hold up to a hundred passengers. Um, getting them through customs, getting their bags, and everything ending up in the right place. So there's a little bit of chaos in pulling this off, but it saves you a lot of time, and that's kind of a plus for uh, what Cheeseman's offers people, is the maximum time on the ground viewing wildlife. Um, I just saw that another company is offering a similar trip to this, but they start and end in Ushuaia, <clears throat> and this crossing from Ushuaia to South Georgia is 1,300 miles. Uh, this crossing is 800. Uh, so this was about two and a half days for us, uh, but this would be three or four days, you know, again, depending on weather. Um, so it does put us on the ground in, in these spots uh, um, longer than, than a, what a lot of other companies offer. Um, these distances are great. So even from Stanley, it's 800 miles to, to, the, to South Georgia Island. And then we spent five or six days doing landings on South Georgia. And then it's a thousand miles to the Antarctic Peninsula, to the South Shetlands and the Peninsula. We made some of the similar landings that I showed you on the Antarctic Peninsula. And then it's 600 miles back. We ended the trip in Ushuaia. Uh, so pretty interesting logistics. 
and a lot of crossing, this thousand mile crossing, we had some bad weather, it slowed us down. So instead of two or three days, it took us like four days to, to make that crossing. <coughs> and these are the spots that we landed on, on South Georgia. All the landing, uh, the other side, the south side or southwest side is more glaciated. I think the better wildlife places are all on this northern coast. And uh, if they, these places in, are relatively famous for their king penguin colonies. Gold Harbor, um, Prince Salisbury Plain, and St. Andrews Bay are some of the really big, famous uh, king penguin colonies that were included in our landings. We were in a race against time. This was very, so this is an early spring season. <coughs> this is, um, uh, this is uh, mid-February to mid-March. Um, no, this is mid-October, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm getting mid-October to mid-November is when this trip was. So it's early spring, and there was like one or two ships ahead of us. On the previous trip, we saw other ships, other cruise ships, uh, actually quite a few of them on the Antarctic Peninsula. We were pretty much leading the pack, and we weren't in a race with the other ships. We were in a race with uh, H1N1, or H5N1 avian flu. Um, it was coming this year. It had raced down the South American coast the previous year, and everybody knew it was going to make it uh, to South Georgia and likely the peninsula this year. And that was potentially going to close landings. In the end, uh, while we were at South Georgia, some reports of dead skuas and cormorants uh, were coming in, and they did close St. Andrews Bay to landings while we were there. After we left, almost all these landings were closed uh, for all ships for the rest of the season. Um, I've heard various reports. Um, there, right after we left, we got reports of high mortalities for Antarctic fur seals and elephant seals, especially pups. Um, but I haven't heard yet great mortality among birds, which is good news, but you know, I, I, there's a lot about the disease I don't know. And there, within the last few weeks, I heard some reports of it getting into finally. This is very late in the season now, uh, getting into uh, Gen, or yeah, Gen two and king penguins. But I haven't heard what I expected, or all of us expected, mass mortality of these birds in these big penguin colonies. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that you know, there is not a large mortality event like we've seen in the northern hemisphere and many other places around the world when the avian flu has, has got to them. So that was kind of our race. We really lucked out, but other boats after us uh, did not get to make these landings. They could do Zodiac cruises, but not go ashore. We got to go ashore everywhere but St. Andrews Bay. This is our group shot from uh, the more recent trip, 93 or 94 passengers and the guides. Uh, here's all the guides in the front row right here, uh, 15 or 16 of us, I think. And this is in the very south, um, uh, south end of South Georgia, uh, where we had great weather and took this picture. You might recognize a face, one of the guides. John Bocci was one of the guides on this trip. It, he's, turns out, friends with Hugh Rose, and independent of me working for Hugh in, on this trip, uh, he got hired to be one of the guides on the trip. And he and I were pinching ourselves several times. Here we are with some chin strap penguins behind us, uh, making a selfie. And uh, the guy on the right here, Scott Davis, he's the new owner of Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris. He bought it from Ted Cheeseman, who was who owned it when I did the first trip, and is, whose parents uh, started the company. Um, but now Scott Davis uh, is the owner, and these are uh, three of the passengers that were on the trip with us. It was rough uh, on many of these crossings as well. We never saw you know, a perfectly calm uh, ocean. And here are high winds. I think this is closer to the South Shetlands when we had these conditions right here. Wind just blowing the spray right off the peaks, or right off the peaks of the waves. Um, but we saw a few new uh, albatross species on the crossings. This is light mantled albatross following the boat. On the first trip, we saw very few of these, and I didn't have any photo opportunities. And we saw lots of gray headed albatross. And here's one flying right up close and personal, you know, almost you know, right off the back of the boat. Uh, we had lots of both of those species. Uh, on this uh, early season trip. Um, also on the first trip, even though they're generally quite common, Cape petrels um, uh, were super abundant on, on this most recent trip, sometimes with dozens following the ship, just flying circles right outside the windows. You'd be eating in the dining room and watching flying outside the window. They're very strikingly colored. 
and then the birders go nuts over some of these like diving petrels, Antarctic or South Georgia diving petrel. I won't even try to guess which one this is, uh, a small seabird that, that dives. And uh, we only saw two or three of these, Antarctic petrel. Uh, a lot of birders were excited uh, when we had the two or three of these birds show up. And uh, the first stop on the second trip was South Georgia. Here's the uh, Plancius anchored. This is actually near Griffigan. Uh, here's Griffigan, the, uh, <coughs> the old whaling station. Uh, it's where uh, Shackleton is buried. And uh, it's a whale graveyard. There's ghosts of tens of thousands of whales uh, you know, were, were slaughtered here. Uh, but it was interesting. There's a neat museum there uh, to tour that site. Um, but what South Georgia is most famous for are king penguins. And again, tears in my eyes when I made the first landing at Right Whale Bay and had a group of king penguins just walk right up to us like we we're not even there. It, it just blew me away. And then, you know, even more with other landings that we made. This is part of that first group. All these, these are all elephant seals uh, sleeping on the beach. And where we landed, there were no seals. You know, we, we land away from wildlife, you know, with the zodiacs and unload people. But this group of penguins, you know, maybe 20, 30 of them were 100 yards down the beach of king penguins, and they all just walked right over to us. Uh, and yeah, just a line like that. This is Bright Whale Bay. And this is what South Georgia is famous for. This is St. Andrews Bay. Uh, this colony has 150,000 pairs of king penguins. And so I imagine that's even more than that. All the brown ones are young, uh, last year's young that are still covered with down. Um, so it's mind boggling, you know, one of the greatest wildlife, you know, views on earth uh, or concentrations on earth is the St. Andrews. And then look at the line of, of elephant seals along the beach. And this is one of the areas where elephant seals were impacted by avian flu and there was a lot of mortality after we left. Um, but anyway, uh, this is where we, the one site we could not go ashore, we Zodiac cruised, but look at that uh, landscape, uh, it was something else. So this is also. Penguins walk over the seals, or uh, they have to find their way around. <laughs> yeah, they all have to work it out. Uh, um, this is also St. Andrew's Bay from the Zodiac. Uh, a bunch of king penguins on a rock, and uh, there was a leopard seal in the water right here that had just caught and maimed a uh, king penguin and was thrashing it around. Again, I'm operating the boat. I barely was able to take this picture, uh, but many of the passengers got pictures of oh, wow. that leopard seal with the king penguin. Uh, these guys were all a little bit afraid to go with water because of what was sitting right in front of them. This is Salisbury Plain, probably the second biggest uh, king penguin colony on South Georgia. 60,000 uh, pairs of penguins, and again, more than that, with all the oakum boys is one of the nicknames for the, the chicks, these blood chicks, the brown ones from last year. Anyway, looking out over this again, you know, makes you well up. Uh, it's the noise, yeah. uh, all the calling. Uh, it, it's it's something something else. It was a dream come true. The smells. Yeah. You know, everybody asks that or states that. I'm kind of nose dead, so I didn't even notice. Uh, maybe some people would be offended by the smell, but it did not register. It was just I was just blown blown away by it. But I've heard people comment about it. Um, here's a view with all the open boys and adults uh, at St. Andrews Bay. Anyway, the king penguins blow you away, and they're the real draw for getting to South Georgia because there's hardly anything on Earth that, that compares to that number of animals. Um, we got one new penguin species at the very southern tip of South Georgia in Cooper Bay, macaroni penguins. I still haven't seen rock hopper. Uh, this was quite early in the season for both rock hopper and macaroni. Um, but at Cooper Bay, they were just arriving. We probably saw 30 or 40 of them at this one colony that Hugh knows about and has visited in the past. And uh, anyway, uh, just before we left South Georgia, got really good looks at macaroni penguins. Uh, quite showy, uh, beautiful uh, looking birds. And a few other things on South Georgia that I had not seen much of on the peninsula. One was elephant seals, huge numbers like you've already seen lining the beaches. Uh, but huge numbers of elephant seals. Uh, this was in Gold Harbor on a Zodiac cruise. We were going to land at, at Gold Harbor. You know, it wasn't closed because of avian flu, but there was nowhere to land. The whole beach was covered with elephant seals or penguins, and there was nowhere where we could get ashore. So this turned into a Zodiac cruise because of the, 
it's kind of ironic that we can't go ashore because of the animals that we came there to see, uh, but it was amazingly dense. Uh, it's a smaller beach than St. Andrews or Salisbury Plain, but it was completely lined with animals and there was nowhere to get ashore. We, like the king penguins, we, we couldn't get through them, uh, but we had a great Zodiac cruise there and it snowed quite heavily uh, while we were doing that. This is back to St. Andrews, I think, the Zodiac cruise, king penguins and elephant seals. Elephant seals, this is in strong nests. This is uh, where Shackleton first made contact with civilization after his <clears throat> uh, big crossing to South Georgia. Elephant seal pup laying in a, a puddle, a little tidal pool. And I mentioned already about avian influenza and the effect on wildlife there. You know, it, it is killing some birds and it is killing marine mammals. At each of the places where we landed, this is the one evidence that we did see of we, we might have seen a, a dead skua or cormorant or two, but we saw very few bird mortalities, almost not a, a enough worth reporting. Um, but at each site, we were seeing dead uh, uh, Antarctic fur seals and elephant seal pups and birds scavenging them. Here's a, a northern giant petrel uh, scavenging a carcass of a, what I think was an Antarctic fur seal. And it, we were just kind of concluding as we were seeing these, like, Hugh has done this trip many times, and you don't like see dead seals in every landing. Uh, these were probably some of the first deaths to avian flu, uh, and it got worse uh, after we were there. Uh, but the, and that's, this is how it gets spread too. But again, um, birds like the giant petrels we weren't hearing of, and even afterwards, I haven't heard of the high mortality of them. When I'd love to, I'm very anxious to hear when it's all said and done what the effects are uh, on all the wildlife down there after the season is over. Uh, it'll be really interesting. And then uh, I mentioned, you know, we've already saw lots of Gentoo penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula. It was very different seeing them on South Georgia, where it's uh, a grassy landscape, um, you know, without all the snow and ice that the peninsula has. South Georgia was quite different that way. But um, they've done a lot to improve conditions on South Georgia because reindeer were introduced, rats were introduced, and they've kind of wreaked havoc with the place. Both have been eradicated successfully, the reindeer and the rats, which is huge. Yeah. And uh, so the grasses are coming back. Here's a reindeer antler with a Gentoo penguin colony up. We have to hike up to this, this uh, location here. And as a result of eliminating, uh, especially the rats, uh, some of the wildlife has come back, is already responding. Here's uh, South Georgia pintails, uh, uh, found only on South Georgia. Uh, they're doing better. But in particular, the South Georgia pipit, and I only got a horrible picture of these. Um, again, it, you're conflicted, you know, being the guide and wanting to get pictures. Uh, this is all I ended up with of the South Georgia pipit, but their numbers are exploding, you know, once since the rats have been removed. Uh, so some wonderful things have happened uh, with the removal of some of the invasive species down there. This is the South Georgia pipit. And then on the second trip, some birds that we saw very little of on the first trip. We saw quite a few of Southern Fulmar. Uh, this is, again, this is now on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, Gerlach Strait is uh, where I photographed this uh, south, uh, Southern Fulmar during a snowstorm. And on the first trip, I saw some snow petrels, just this gorgeous snow white bird. I call them perfect because they are just so pure white. And in that landscape, they, they were probably my favorite bird from, from both trips. Um, anyway, I saw just one or two or three of them on the first trip, but on this most recent trip, they were everywhere. And this is one of my favorite yeah. pictures of the trip, uh, was the snow petrel in a snowstorm uh, in Gerlach Strait on the Antarctic Peninsula. It's just spectacular how pure white they are and flying around the boat, uh, you know, just kind of a dream. So contrast these pictures with the portraits of penguins that you saw from my previous trip. When we got there in what's their early spring, so this is probably around the 1st of November or so, or early days of November, the whole landscape was covered with snow. Again, climate change is leading to greater snowfalls on the Antarctic Peninsula, and the ground, the bare ground that these gentoo penguins need to nest on is being exposed later and later, so they're having to hang out, but it makes for wonderful pictures. And uh, here's three gentoos walking on the snow, Here's the Gentoo at Cooperville Island. Uh, that was previous picture was Cooperville Island. Um, here's one laid on the snow facing me. 
Uh, here's the plant CS that I showed you, Cooperville Island, the penguin colony with the bare rock, you know, covered with penguin shit and pink and stuff. This is how pristine and white everything looked uh, on this trip uh, at Cooperville Island. And this is also was Cooperville. Uh, it was spectacular, uh, even though, you know, they're just having to hang out and wait uh, for their opportunity to nest. And then uh, we maybe saw a few chin straps in the meantime, but as we left the Antarctic Peninsula on the South Georgia trip, um, we went to Deception Island and Yankee and Half Moon Island and Yankee Harbor, where we saw many more chin straps. And these are chin straps again, waiting for chances to nest. Those locations were quite snowy. Some places on uh, Half Moon Island were bearing off and there were rocks available, so they were just starting some nest building. This is the only nest building that we saw on the whole trip. Remember on the previous trip, there were baby penguins in nests, some quite large. Uh, well, we saw no nesting, uh, but here at Half Moon, at the end of our trip, uh, some rocks were becoming exposed that chin straps were starting to build nests with. And here they are, starting a little rock pile to build a nest uh, to a chin strap pair. And I'll end with this spectacular event that kind of made the trip. It was the favorite event for everybody that went on this trip. And this is Danko Island. It's very close to Cooperville. It's one of the main places people go to view uh, uh, Gentoo penguins or penguins on Antarctic trips. And when we were at Cooperville Island the day before, through binoculars, I, I knew where uh, Danko was, you know, because I'd been there you know, earlier in the year and I knew we were going there the next day. I looked through binoculars. And I could see it, the patches of penguins on the snow. Uh, there were a couple large patches of penguins. I go, cool, we're going to be there tomorrow. Uh, it'll be neat. Well, when we pulled up on the Plantius to anchor and started launching Zodiacs, I started looking around like I, I was disoriented. And everything does look a little bit the same uh, because of all the rock and glacier, it's, uh, especially being relatively new to the area. Um, it can be disorienting. But I kept looking for what I thought was Danko Island, and I wasn't seeing any penguins. I saw maybe a dozen on the one little rock outcrop and maybe a couple, a dozen are on the beach or something, but there weren't the hundreds or thousands that I'd seen through binoculars the day before. And I thought I was looking in the wrong place, but there was, some, there was pink stained snow you know, where they had been. And as we launched the Zodiacs, it started taking people, or we brought ourselves ashore before we bring passengers to kind of prep the site. Um, we realized there's no penguins here, they're gone. There were some penguins here yesterday, but they, for some reason, had all gone back into the ocean. So we start chopping steps and laying out trails as we get ready to uh, bring the passengers ashore. And literally, as I'm chopping steps, well, there were some rafts of, of gentoos in the, in the water. You can see these patches, black patches of, of gentoos uh, that, you know, offshore. Um, but as we were getting the zodiacs ashore, all the guides were coming and prepping the place. And I literally was chopping steps in this ice shelf. There was a wall of ice uh, on, the, on the tide line uh, where the snow came down to, this, uh, to the tide water. And it turns out the only time penguins could get from the ocean onto that ice, the snowpack, was at high tide. At low tide, that wall was impenetrable to them. So I'm chopping uh, steps. And as I'm chopping, the tide just so, so happened to be coming in and approaching high tide. I almost got hit in the head by a penguin leaping out of the water. And what we saw in the next two hours like blew everybody away and joe kaplan who's guided here for 20 years just kept saying i've never seen this i've oh, wow. never seen this we estimate eight thousand penguins came ashore in two hours right where we were standing <laughs> and i'll illustrate this with pictures as best i can and then a video so here's that crowd of penguins for two hours these groups these flocks came ashore and just flew flung themselves out of the water and then just marched up um, these are two pictures from uh, one of the clients, Nina, I, I took them from the group slideshow just to illustrate our front row seat watching this. We, we were off to the side, not blocking them at, 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 in any way, and at high tide they had access to the snowpack, and here we just stood just watching uh, these penguins come ashore. Here's a group getting ready to come ashore in the foreground, there's one of our zodiacs, and there's a group of us off to the side, and then uh, Here's the army uh, going to the top of the mountain. There's a colony where they nest, uh, we saw the previous year, or previous, you know, my previous trip, to the left on that bench, and then at the top of the mountain are two spots that bear off and support colonies later in the season. And they must have just gone to the ocean to feed because they couldn't nest yet, and were returning with the high tide, and we got to watch this uh, just incredible event. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to play a video of it, and this runs uh, a, a couple minutes, I think. These are a uh, uh, video I took with my phone, and it just kind of illustrates uh, how spectacular this event was. 8,000 penguins over two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Brooks Falls has nothing on this, huh? <laughs> I'm just sitting with waiters uh, right off to the side of where they're all coming ashore with my phone. Uh, just watching this unfold, it was just mind blowing. <laughs> All the guides have been coming for years. We're blown away by this. Uh, it caught us by surprise. It was just, you know, this was an incredible natural event. We just got lucky to see why it happened, just when it did, and to this magnitude, we don't know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, really impressive. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, so for anybody who wants to see Antarctica, you know, how, how can you do this? Uh, it's not easy, and I, I feel very, very lucky to have gotten the experience that I did. But I'll throw out some ideas for you. Um, first of all, research positions. And since we're kind of a science-based community, many people in this room have science degrees and stuff. Uh, Ann Schaefer has been to Palmer Station doing research on penguins. That is one good example. And follow up on your wildlife backgrounds and look for positions like that. That would be my first way. Get Why not get paid to do it? Um, the other is McMurdo, and many people in this town have worked at McMurdo. McMurdo isn't so much a wildlife place, though. It's inland. There are some penguins that show up there, and I believe there's a coastal outpost that does have wildlife. Dave Zastro and Dave Rosenthal, and uh, we can name some others, uh, Andy Morris, uh, uh, Tanya, have all worked at McMurdo. That's another place, but I won't call that the best wildlife destination. But just, again, spending time in Antarctica is, is spectacular. That's much further south on the continent. Um, the other is Antarctic cruises. That's what I've fallen into. And first, you could go as a passenger. Uh, my trip uh, that I was on, the cheapest seats are around 15 grand. And depending on the rooms that you get, they're up to 25 grand for the, yeah, for the South Georgia trip. Um, sometimes they can be cheaper, and there are other companies and other ways to do it. Um, I know a woman uh, from Anchorage who was in South America and hoping to get on a trip, space available. It was a short trip, but for $3,500 from Ushuaia, she kind of, there's a company that fills vacant spaces on cruise ships, and it's a short trip, 10 days uh, total, and two or three of those each way are, you know, crossing Drake passage so you get three or four days or five days if you're lucky on the Antarctic Peninsula but you get to see it uh, so that's about as cheap as you probably ever get to do it as a passenger but that opportunity does exist and then there's there's larger cruise ships that hold 200 or 400 passengers but they're not allowed to land at some of the sites and there's there's IATO this International Association of Antarctic Tourism uh, op tour operators that has set its own regulations of how many people at a time, what size ships are allowed to certain places. And Cheeseman's uh, running on the Plancius um, is, a mat, is, doesn't carry more than 100 passengers, which, allow, which allows us to visit any of the locations and put everybody on shore at one time. Um, whereas if you have 200 people on a boat, 100 people can go ashore and the other people have to go on a Zodiac cruise or, or kayak or uh, do something else but they can't go ashore at that place. Not that that's bad, but anyway, the company I've been working for maximizes your opportunity to get ashore and see all this stuff. So it has been really good. And then private vessels is the other way. Uh, Hamish is the one who came to mind, but there's- You could stay for months and months. <laughs> yeah, and then you stay for months and months. That would be the dream, exactly. 
Um, and this is just a plug for the company that I work for. Um, we have a trip coming in 2025, October, November, 2025, uh, up to a hundred people. Uh, that's still, you know, quite a ways out. Um, and the cost is 17 grand to 25 grand. Um, but I have friends that are interested in this sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to share it with them and I'm hoping to be one of the guys. I haven't got the confirmation, but I got my fingers crossed and I hope it all works out that I get to do this again. Okay, you guys are welcome to leave. That was what I had for a slideshow, but I have two other things. Are you willing to see two short videos? Oh yeah. Are you, nobody's in a hurry? Um, one of them is from a guy named uh, George DeSort. He was a new guide. He was a friend of Joe Kaplan's, the very good birder who's guided for Cheeseman's for 20 years. He's a friend of Joe's and got in on his first trip on this most recent trip of mine to South Georgia. And his background is video. And he has a knack of editing video together. And he did some instructional uh, workshops for the passengers. You know, we, we all put on presentations. But his workshops are really popular. And he works with an iPhone. And he was teaching people how to shoot, how to plan a video, how to shoot the clips, and how to um, put them in place with a storyline and make a story, tell a story with video. And he did a neat job of this is his video of, of the trip. Um, it's about five minutes long, and it starts with his mom. He's from Wisconsin. All right, where, where am I going? Yeah. 